first memory is of actually skating on the Little Miami River, ice skating, more or less, with the, the little ones, at the Jacoby, uh, at the Grinnell Mill. There's a dam, which is mostly uh, broken now, but then I think there, it was more of a dam, so there was this area, and we skated, and it was great fun. To, you know, I still, you know, like, I'll take my children, we go to the river, and we walk along the river, we talk, and I share stories with them, and, you know, and we make our offerings and stuff, yeah. because, you know, the water is essential in that we have that relationship with them, yeah. with the river. So, you know, I tell my kids, the water's whole memories. Yeah. And I said, and I said, and if you pay attention, and I said, and you can hear them. We used it a lot. My husband and I were married 50 years, and a lot of our anniversaries were spent on the river. We would take our bikes and lock them down north, and then we'd, um, the other way around. We'd take our canoe at the time, and we'd drop it, and then we'd drive down to like Morrow and the other end, ride our bikes up to the canoe, and then ride our, <laughs> do our canoe down, and then make a round circle. And that was our day. That was our anniversary celebration. It's in May, and we loved watching the birds. It's a great migration time when they're all coming through and on the river. I really enjoy that. The water quality and, you know, the, the river corridor itself have maintained high level or even improved. And I think that's um, a credit to a lot of the work of, well, our, our Scenic Rivers program and our other partners. I used to have this friend named Prentice Thomas, who was a, a guy that I did trees with in Yellow Springs. And Prentice was a river rat like me. And uh, so we, we had this loose group we called the Flash Flood Yacht Club. And we would canoe to Little Miami every month of the year. Uh, we, yeah, every month. Um, and Prentice and I had many adventures on the river, but one of my favorite ones. Um, if you're headed down the river and you're almost to the 68th bridge, there's a great big uh, sycamore tree that's uh, formed in a Y. And there's a hole in that sycamore tree where a great horned owl has lived forever and ever. And so one day we're paddling down the river and Prentice decides that we haven't seen the great horned owl and maybe I should stand up in the canoe and look in the hole there and see if they were in there. Well, <laughs> I saw these two great big yellow dinner plate looking eyes and I just had enough time to duck before I got a face full of talons and it came flying out. I almost fell out of the canoe. My dad fished all kinds of ponds and lakes, but he especially loved streams. And the Little Miami River was close. We grew up in uh, East Dayton. And, um, you know, it was just not that long a drive up to Dorothy Lane. Yeah. And then turn left on Dorothy Lane and head out to the Little Miami, uh, head towards Xenia on Dorothy Lane. And one of his favorite places to fish was uh, right where the Little Miami River crosses what's Dorothy Lane today. It's called the Narrows today, but this is before there was any uh, 
park or any improvements there. And, you know, I remember us just pulling over off the road, hopefully not getting stuck next to a guardrail or something, and, you know, watching out for traffic as we ran around to the back of the station wagon and grabbed his fishing rod uh, because I didn't have one in those days. I was too young, I guess, to do that. And, you know, I would tag along down to the stream side and do what any child does. Water is magic with children, and I would sometimes be scolded for throwing my rock where Dad was fishing, but most of the time, you know, I was just exploring up and down the banks. I'm not sure if I was seven or eight, so that would be like 82, 83. When was this really cold winter, like, and the river froze? Really? The river froze, and we invited our cousins over um, from Centerville, and we all had an ice hockey game on the river. And there, there, we had two cones as goals upstream, and two goals for uh, two cones for goals as downstream. And I think I was seven or eight, but I remember the, seeing the water come over the ice. So upstream, the water was, and so we had to scramble off the ice real quick. But it was thick enough. That, that really cold winter. My mom says it was like minus 25 degrees. Yeah. It was, um, it, and I don't think that would happen now because the river is faster. Um, my kids want it to freeze, and it you know sometimes you get the ice on the edges, but it doesn't get close to no. doing that. Uh, probably the first, uh, actually on the river, was back in the middle to late 70s. Uh, Father Mick from our church uh, uh, was a, said, let's go into Little Miami. And so our oldest son, who was probably around uh, 12 maybe, or even less than that, and our uh, younger son, three years younger, uh, was headed on down it. And uh, we uh, spent the night somewhere that we don't think we were allowed to. and. Uh, and we had a tipping, and we had a portage, and all those things, and uh, we uh, ate uh, well, you know. And uh, we got down tomorrow, and uh, we decided that that was as far as we could make it. I don't know whether we had our own canoe, whether we rented them. I don't know how we ever got back, because we didn't have cell phones then, you know, but I assume some, there was a phone board down there. So that was my first experience. And I don't remember going down and picking them up or anything, so maybe they spotted wings and flew back. I don't know what you know. It's a long walk. <laughs> it is a long walk. <laughs> when I was uh, a little younger and riding my bicycle a lot, um, we would go out and ride some pretty long rides, and one day we decided we'd go find the headwaters of the Little Miami. And um, so we rode out to South Charleston and kept riding along what turned out to be more or less a drainage ditch along the side of the road until it came up. Um, it, I seem to remember that the guy's house was a log cabin, um, you know, back on a lot. And the river came up in a spring right in the guy's front yard. So we've, we've seen the headwaters of the Little Miami where it, where it uh, ups them. I guess I should say that I became acquainted with the river before I was born because my parents courted <laughs> along the Little Miami River so you cheated. <laughs> at Foster where there was a dam and where they had refreshments and they told me about that and then when my father passed in 1954 I uh, put his ashes into the river, whether that was legal or not, because he wanted it that way. 94, middle of 94, June actually, uh, decided to uh, come over here because that National Geographic special issue on the United States scenic rivers uh, came out, I believe, in June 77 or something like that. And, uh, and I said, if you are going to, if you are going to live in uh, this area, 
what will be the best location? And I said, what, what, I mean, it, it has to be Little Miami River, along the Little Miami River. And I started looking for the property and uh, place, and I found this and a few others, but this was so close to the town, but also so isolated in that sense, uh, just tucked into the, the foliage and the trees of the Little Miami just I fell in love with this I did not even spend five minutes inside the house that I was about to buy just just walked the property walked the trails and walked along the river and it was just beautiful it was just fascinating and I said this is where I want to be When you're young and in school, up through high school, you can do a lot of things that maybe you, your parents aren't aware of. <laughs> and uh, my brothers and I would uh, make some rafts. We would put them in probably up on Washington Mill where the, it's real close to the uh, road. And uh, we'd see how far we can go before the rafts would collapse. And our best raft was probably uh, four barrels. We had a platform on top and uh, we'd, uh, I think we made it as far as uh, Spring Valley that time. <clears throat> and uh, we had to go, of course, get it. Brought the raft back and uh, after dad died, we had an auction and we had the raft setting outside the barn and the uh, auctioneer Popped up on it and sold it before we could tell them <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that to be sold. Oh, that's a family heirloom there. <laughs> <laughs> the USS Barry. Yeah. Other memories I had, uh, fun things, sort of. Um, Little Miami floods almost every year, and sometimes two or three years. And uh, the worst flood I could remember happened in the uh, winter of 1959. Everything around here was frozen, had snow on the ground, and a warm front came through this area. Then it got uh, finally drained, and the uh, ice on it was maybe an inch and a half thick or something like that. And as the water receded, the ice just floated down on top of it. So it finally quit settling, uh, and you can ice skate on it. The only problem was you could not stop because once you stopped, you fell through the ice. <laughs> Luckily, water's only about three feet deep. <laughs> so again, here I am hoofing it back home, pants, uh, ice frozen. So we did have some good times. The races uh, came about after I I, I, I got uh, uh, canoeing and went on trips with, uh, with uh, Bob Morgan's uh, uh, operation in Fort Ancient. He was the first livery on the Little Miami River in 1969. We became fast friends, and so we would race. And at first, we started at the Foster's Dam, which has since been removed. And then we'd paddle up a couple of miles in that pool of water up to the King's Dam around the buoy and come down and end up in. Milford, 21 to 23 miles downstream, nonstop, and that was part of Milford Frontier Days, and that's where we finished. In the middle of the Foster's Dam, it, there was a, a V break that you couldn't see because of it being covered by water, and they, there was a make channel just by the stream current all the way on the east bank, right around the corner, and you could see it. You could see the V in the water. But if you knew about the break in the wall, which Bob Morgan told me about, you could scoot through there and pick up a couple of minutes of time on everyone else in the race. So those of us that knew, heaven help you, if you, it was tight. If you got stuck, you had a chance of getting flipped. So we, we, we did a lot of that. And both Mike and Bob, I, I affectionately always said to Bob that I recognize him from his, the back because uh, he was always ahead of me. So. Same with Mike, so. but I was glad to be there. We, we always did pretty, pretty well. One day we're set, starting at Foster's, and Sam Hearn, it was Sam Hearn, Mark Reen, the 
and they sell watercraft, you know, speedboats, rowboats, canoes. And uh, Sam Hearn, I look over to my left, this was a mass start, clanging and banging and people pushing and shoving. And, you know, it was uh, all lined up together. Off we go. And there's, two, there's Sam over there standing up and his partner standing up. So they were going to paddle standing up. So that was about 30 years ahead of anybody that even thought about a paddle board. I looked over, we, we're going to start in about four minutes. I, Bob was a couple of canoes over. I said, Bob, look at, look at Sam over there. I said, the guy's crazy. He, he's he's going to get knocked off. He's going to get a tip him over. So that was, that was a funny, funny time. And then every time I would do this race, I would think about, I'm not going to do it again <laughs> because you feel so spent at the end. But at the end, there's food and glory and music and you know, awards and just a lot of good feeling for people out in the fresh air doing something uh, fun and worthwhile. My favorite place is the Clifton Gorge area, mainly because of the river is very narrow and you can see fish in the water because it's, it's shallow and the two bridges in uh, State Park there, you can sit on a bridge and watch, watch that water go by. My wife and I did that uh, for years. She passed away a year and a half ago. And, Sorry. Uh, but she, she enjoyed that, and that's the reason why I, I wanted to propose to her in the Little Miami River area, because of uh, our memories are there. It sounds like that would be your, your fondest memory of the river. Yes, it is. It, it is a very good memory. He asked me to marry him at the Narrows. Like, we went for a walk along, you know, just in the main um, route there, and I could tell he was being really weird. I didn't <laughs> understand why. Um, but, yeah, we just walked in maybe 10 minutes and then went and sat down by the river, and he popped the question with a ring and everything. And at that point, I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, what is going on? He was so nervous. Um, but um, yeah, so I obviously said yes, and three children and 15 years later. I, I said I came from Australia. Um, I grew up on the ocean. So coming, when I moved here, it felt very strange to me to be so landlocked. And so I really saw the river as my version of the ocean here. And I, I would say that's one of the main reasons why I was drawn to it, because you know, I'm, water has always been a central focus of my life. So, um, so yeah, a little different from the Pacific Ocean, but uh, yeah. <laughs> the crashy waves. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still water. It's still life, right? Tecumseh, our greatest chief, was born, what, five arrow flights away? They stay from here, yeah. Right over there, Just on go. his way to the village with his family. Uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> and, he, and then when his father died, uh, Tecumseh was brought here to the principal village with his mother and his siblings, and the principal chief raised him, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so he grew up right here. Uh, there's a sycamore in my neighbor's yard where he would tie his canoe and he would go visit the Galloways right at the end of my lane. We have the first marker set in Greene County for uh, the Galloway family yeah. out in the front. And yeah. you said that's where the copse of trees is out? Oh yeah, where the cabin was? Yeah. Yeah, it's up on 68. Yeah, just north so, of, the, of the driveway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't know, being here now as a Shawnee, it's just a uh, sacred ground to us. This river is sacred. So well, I can't do enough to take care of it. It's uh, part of my, my, my being. So, you know, we're here, we're still here. That's my biggest thing with him, just being right here. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you know he walked this right here. Sure. Saw yeah. these trees. Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite stories is when they would, it was like a coming of age story for young men. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would go and uh, go into the river every day for two weeks, right? It was for almost a year. Uh -huh. Yeah, blackfish. And uh, 
they, they would dive in at the end of it and grab an unsoma, which would symbolize their heat inside, you know, to their keep spirit. warmth in their spirit. spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think he did it right out here at the swimming hole. <laughs> Because there's another swimming hole like this on this river. It's south of Kilcare. Is it? I, I there's only two. Know. Okay. And so if he was going to dive in somewhere, I He's think it was right here. in the middle of the here. village. <laughs> yeah, but they made him dive in every day for a year. And in the summer, it was really nice and pleasant. He had to go to the bottom and come back up. But in the winter, then he had to learn how to break ice. And I'm sure you, you've heard that story that it spent, you know, it toughened him up. And then Blackfish said, now when you go down, grab five pebbles, or just grab a handful, and he came up with five pebbles. Yeah. Uh, Which my understanding is still, Shawnee people still have those Yeah. Pebbles. Oh, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. Between um, Clifton Mill, which is the only one still operating, and Grinnell Mill, which still stands, although it's now a bed and breakfast, all the other mills in between are just ruined. There were at least five or six. And a, um, and a distillery seven springs whiskey because there were a bunch of springs that came out that they uh, used to get the water. And you can still see the blocks, the cement blocks that held that building up. Yeah, probably the most spectacular mill was the Patterson Mill, which was actually a woolen and cotton mill. And it was up in the Narrows. We've got a plaque there where it stood. It was built, it was a, like a three and a half story, almost like a big barn and it was built across the gorge. You could actually go in one side on the uh, south side, or north side, go down the steps, come out on the no uh, south side. And so if you can imagine this huge building sitting in the narrows, and um, it, it was powered by a 22-foot overshot wheel. The water came over the top. The dam was almost right beneath the mill, so all they had to do was channel the water to the mill. Probably the oldest named feature, I would guess the oldest named feature is the Blue Hole, which is a place where the river widens. The Blue Hole is actually kind of famous, although a lot of people don't know it. <laughs> that's, a, that's kind of an oxymoron there. But if you go to the Cincinnati Museum of Art, there's a pretty famous painting in the Hudson River School called High Water, Blue Hole, Little Miami River. It was painted by uh, one of the, well, by the first African-American artist to get any kind of recognition back in the mid-1800s. This was all private, obviously, privately owned up until the 60s by a man named George Grendel. And he also knew what he had here in the gorge, so he made it into kind of a tourist attraction. He would had a little ice cream stand under the ledge there and the steps so you could go down. And um, he would take people in boat rides up in the Narrows and he had signs on the rock wall, uh, caveman's head and different things. Um, he also had probably the most famous thing associated with Clifton Gorge. He also had a bear, Muggins the bear, female bear. He evidently got it, either he got it or he was given it by some hunters up in the that went up into Canada. They brought it back. He ended up with it. He built a cage for it, um, had it here. People would come out as much to see Muggins the bear as to see the gorge. He had a little, he lived right here. The house is gone, but he used to live right there. And he had a, a little stand or a little entry gate and he would sell pop and ice cream. And of course, kids would come in and see the pop and they didn't dad, do that. Yeah, well, plus the dad had to shell out and buy them all pop and they'd run over and feed it to the bear right away. Well, then, of course, the kids, oh, I want some pop. So he had to shell out again and buy pop. So George knew what he had going. I just think every trip on the river has its own specialness and it gives you that time to not only connect with nature, but connect with God and have that time to, un uninterrupted time, to talk with the people you're with. There's no television, there's no radio, there's, you're not looking at your phone and getting, like, you know, swarmed into, just sucked into social media. And it's just that wonderful time that you get to be with the people you love and care about and immersed in, in nature and God's beauty. And it's just so pure and organic and um, peaceful. So I think every moment on the river is a good moment. <laughs> we love to go out and get dirty and have fun on the river and just enjoy.
enjoy nature, and it's an ongoing favorite memory every time we go. It's a new favorite. So. Well, and I think it also helps them to learn about ecosystems and how we impact the ecosystem and how important it is to do their part. Even if they think they're little, every little bit matters, you know. That, so when they're actually immersed in it and they see it and they enjoy it, then they're going to respect it because they want to keep it. And, um, and then learning about the animals, their habitats, their food, their, um, you know, ones that have gone extinct, why they've gone extinct, and how to save the ones that are, are still there so that when they have kids, they can teach them about that. And so Ron does a, a really good job at pointing out all of that information. And we've been learning a lot about the earth and all of the rocks and how, you know, it is amazing how long it's been around and may it be around that much longer. <laughs> so. And the blankets in the Miami that's pretty. <laughs> and, what's, and what's Daddy's role when we're in the kayak? Can't bring in any more any garbage bigger than the kayak. <laughs> you girls like picking garbage out of the river and the lakes. Yeah. They keep it clean. Why is that important? Because it protects the environment and the, the animals that are living there that are yeah. drinking the water and the and the animals that live in the water. And it keeps the river clean so we can still put boating or rafting. <laughs> I would probably suggest the thing that I tend to do um, at my house when maybe I'm feeling overwhelmed or stressed or whatever is just go sit down by the river and listen you know, just try to put everything else out of your mind and listen to the sounds, right? It's this living, breathing piece of nature that we couldn't exist without. So for me, just sitting, watching, you know, the different sounds of the water running over the rocks where it's shallow, you know, where it's not, just all the different sounds that a river produces. Well, I find that paddling, after about the first 20 minutes, becomes a soulful experience. You know, I'm not a religious person, but people have said, well, you are spiritual. It didn't really register with me until they called my attention to the, uh, the calming effect. There's something uh, aesthetically satisfying about, about the liquidity of the water and the, the sweep of the paddle through it. I find that whatever I was worried about beforehand falls away. out of a kayak and walk on a sandbar, pick up a trilobite or a fossil, an Indian artifact, seeing some mallard geese or a great, uh, great blue heron, uh, see some of the eagles in the uh, sycamore trees, and uh, just enjoy the beautiful uh, scenery that it offers. It sure does. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us about your experience and love for the River Miami River? Just that I plan on uh, continuing my relationship with it.